The world is flooded with secret societies. Their members range from unknown citizens and eccentrics to top executives in the most important companies, banks, and even governments. Some have become famous in recent years because of the boom in conspiracy literature. Three of them in particular in recent years have caught the public eye. Skull and Bones, the Bilderberg Group, and the Council on Foreign Relations, or the CFR. To their members, these are nothing but innocent fraternities or simple think tanks. To their critics, parallel world governments. As always, the truth lies somewhere in between. The United States of America is the most powerful country in the world, the single remaining superpower that dictates the global agenda. But ironically, the political system of this champion of democracy was built under the guidance of mysterious fraternities and organizations we know little or nothing about. Secret societies have actively participated in the construction of the American governmental system. Freemasonry, to name just one society, left its imprint on the Declaration of Independence, the American Constitution, and on dozens of national symbols, from the Great Seal of the US to the Dollar Bill. This American passion for secrets, rituals, and exclusive clubs has been particularly strong in its universities, where the fraternity system was developed. The fraternities or frats as they're most commonly referred to, are student associations with academic and philanthropic goals. However, they also abound in codes of silence and initiation rites, very similar to those found in Freemasonry and other secret societies. The first ever recorded frats were the Flat Hat Club and the Phi Beta Kappa, both founded at Yale University. Also in Yale, one of the most enigmatic and most notorious fraternities in the world arose, one that has always been favored by the cream of American society. Its name, Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones was founded in 1832. Its original name was the Eulogian Club. Its creator was a merchant named William Huntington Russell, owner of Russell and Company, a transport company which was rumored to smuggle opium into China during the Opium Wars. The name Skull and Bones probably comes from a curious tradition. During their meetings in the campus chapel at Yale, the society used to hang a skull and two crossed shin bones upon the door as a warning that they should not be disturbed. The society was also known as the Order of Death, Cooperation Star, or simply the Order. In 1856, 24 years after its foundation, the order was granted an important plot of land on the university campus and built its official headquarters there. It is a windowless stone construction that can still be seen today. They call it the tomb. The tomb has a dark, labyrinth-like layout that spans three floors in an attic. It compromises a number of halls and secret cabinets chambers with mannequins in full armor, candlesticks, old photos, flags and manuscripts, and a sinister collection of bones, supposedly belonging to historical figures, including the skulls of Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa and the Indian chief Geronimo, and even that of Panamanian dictator General Omar Torrijos. In the keep of the labyrinth, there is a vault with the enigmatic number 322 on the door. Inside, there are just two chairs and a table. This was where the candidates are said to meet Madame, a skeleton that is supposed to be that of Madame Pompadour. 
Their passion for bones and skulls could be considered in bad, albeit innocent, taste. However, a much more serious accusation hangs over the Brotherhood of Death. It's sympathy for the Nazis. Critics of Skull and Bones insist that the society is not originally American, but rather an offshoot of some German right-wing order. This could well be true. Its founder, William Russell, did indeed live for some time in Germany before attending to his senior year at Yale. And it was actually on returning to the USA that he established the fraternity. Always according to its critics, the number 322, the order's identifying number, hides a coded message. The 32 represents the year of its foundation, 1832. And the additional two stands for the fact that it's the second chapter within an international order. Alexandra Robbins, a Yale graduate and author of a book on the subject, stated that the society owns a valuable collection of Nazi objects and memorabilia, and eats its dinners off Hitler's private silver service. A large part of their liturgy is written in German. Who was the fool? Who was the wise man? beggar or king, whether poor or rich, all's the same in death. A sizable part of the American military industrial complex of the early 20th century collaborated with the Nazi regime in Germany, contributing immensely to their rise to power. This historical fact is unknown to most people even today. Also unknown is the strong involvement of Bonesmen in the pre-war German-American relations. But history keeps its own records, and the past always returns to haunt us. In 1930, Prescott Sheldon Bush, father of President George H, and grandfather of President George W, a member of the Skull and Bones class of 1917, and president of the Union Banking Corporation, engaged in a number of profitable business deals with Fritz Thyssen, the German steel tycoon who supplied Hitler's war machine. The UBC was closed by President Truman during the Second World War under the Trading with the Enemy Act. In other words, for doing business with the Nazis. Apart from Prescott Bush, several other directors of the Union Banking Corporation in New York were also 1917 bonesmen, including E. Roland Harriman and Ellery Sedgwick James. In 1938, Bush, by then executive associate of Brown Brothers Harriman, issued a loan to Hitler's Germany to enable the latter to import American standard oil fuel. In 1941, the year the United States entered the war against the Third Reich, Standard Oil, which belonged to Rockefellers, bonesmen themselves, had six oil tankers sailing under Panamanian flags and manned by German crews. These vessels carried fuel from their American refineries to the Canary Islands, where their German submarines were being refueled. In the meantime, Allied troops were losing their lives on European battlefields. Investigator Anthony Sutton claims that Skull and Bones is not at all an American society, but a branch of a foreign secret society. According to this expert, it is one of the reasons why secrecy in the order is so vital. However, the list of its members is a true who's who of American society. Many of these influential personalities are advocates of the American way of life. Skull and Bones membership certainly has its privileges. At least three American presidents were, or are, bonesmen. George W. Bush, his father George H. Bush, and William Taft. The proposition that this small club of the well-to-do pulls the strings of American power, and through it those of the whole world, by placing its associates in key power positions, is supported by substantial evidence. The elections of 2004 saw the almost impossible come true. Both the Republican candidate, George W. Bush, and his Democrat rival, John F. Kerry, were members of Skull and Bones. That's to say, prior to running as representatives of parties, 
that supposedly propound opposite political visions. They had both sworn allegiance to the same mysterious principles. And what's worse, they share secrets that are not known to their own constituents. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? The million dollar question for American citizens and the world as a whole is do bonesmen put their frat fidelity above that of their civic responsibilities? As the BCCI case clearly shows, the answer is undeniably yes. By the end of the 1980s, the scandal concerning the Bank of Commerce and Credit International was making the headlines. The BCCI was accused of laundering drug money and financing terrorist operations. The scandal tarnished the reputation of the US government since the bank operated freely in America and was a regular contributor to political campaigns. The administration of bonesman George H. Bush blocked the investigation, which had in any case been entrusted to a Senate commission chaired by bonesman John Kerry. The BCCI was absorbed by more respectable banks and the subject was never revived. Who runs Skull and Bones? Up to what point are Bonesmen able to influence the decisions of fellow members? Perhaps by looking into their initiation rituals, we will be able to have some idea of what kind of power the society holds over its brethren, whether they are industry leaders, intellectuals or politicians, and speculate how they use that power should the need arise. Each year, only 15 students entering their senior year at the University of Yale are admitted. The candidates must have been tapped by those senior classmen of Yale University who make up the current membership. The criterion for selection also includes the candidates' potential to increase the power and prestige of the society. Two votes against the candidate are enough for him to be rejected. During their initiation, candidates must recount all their sexual exploits. Finally, they are expected to perform various oaths, kiss some feet, and drink blood. They then have to lie naked in a coffin, and, after masturbating in full view of the others, swear to never reveal their membership of the order. The candidates are then introduced to their future companions, who wear masks for the occasion. Uncle Toby, the knights, the small devil, Don Quixote, and the Pope. The ceremony ends with a grand party that lasts for hours. To imagine presidents of the United States in this situation is highly disturbing, but even more distressing is to realize that the candidate is now subject to blackmail. All the brethren have witnessed the humiliation of the candidate. Each one has spoken of his darkest secrets. Nobody now feels he can break the pact of silence with the order. As of that moment, betrayal is highly unlikely. The government of the world's only superpower is packed with bonesmen. George W. Bush named 11 bonesmen officials in his first government. Add to this various senators, congressmen, and chief justices, directors of the CIA, the Federal Reserve, and directors of banks such as J.P. Morgan Chase and Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. The American media is little different. Among others, Time and Newsweek magazines, in theory competitors, were both founded by Bonesman. The oldest and most influential families also belong to this select club. Bush, Bundy, Harriman, Lord, Phelps, Rockefeller, 